the time to join us, securing digital networks is one of the most important challenges all businesses face. Today's expert, Connect, educating for cyber mindfulness, building a community of cyber allies, we hope, will provide a practical approach to solving one aspect of good cybersecurity for any organization, and that is teaching users safe computing habits. Uh, before we begin, uh, a few housekeeping chores. We will try to leave 15 minutes at the end of this session for a q and If you have questions for our presenters, you will find a button at the bottom of your screen marked Q&A. Please post your questions there. When we're ready for your question, we will call on you. If we don't have a chance to get to your question, we will email you a response at the end of this, web, uh, this webinar. Uh, one other point too, we are recording this Ex Expert Connect. It will be available on the CGE YouTube channel by end of day tomorrow. Now to the reason we're here. We are fortunate and want to thank the researchers and practitioners from the University of Dayton Center for Cybersecurity and Data Intelligence for sharing their strategies, tactics, and the lessons they learned developing and implementing a cyber mindfulness campaign. Universities have long been among the most vulnerable and frequent targets for cyber intrusions. They are, in a sense, the canaries in the coal mine for the latest cybersecurity threats. And after all, most of their customers or students are on the cutting edge of technology, often checking out the latest apps, tech products, and websites uh, with hardly a thought to security. No wonder the school came up with a strategy for turning its users from security risks to allies. I'm gonna turn over the mic to Thomas Skill, Associate Provost and CIO of the University of Dayton, who will introduce the rest of the presenters and get on with explaining the Cyber Mindfulness Program. Thank you, Tom. Great, thanks Ira, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're really thrilled to be here today. Uh, I wanna to express a special thanks to CGE for inviting us to share our work today. We're gonna, we're gonna be uh, sharing with you our model for developing cybersecurity awareness. We think it might be helpful as you think about ways that your organization might implement awareness training. And so what we're gonna do is, first I'm gonna start off and introduce a few of our folks here. Um, as, as I, uh, said, I'm Tom Skill, I'm the Associate Provost at the University of Dayton and, and Chief Information Officer. Uh, with us today also is Dr. James Robinson, a Professor of Communication and our, our resident social scientist that's helped us work through a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, behavior issues that we are trying to grapple with. And then also with us is uh, Kim Condi, she's our IT Coordinator for Communications, uh, and Elizabeth Timmons, um, who serves as our Web Services Manager. And of course, they are the co-directors of this project, so they have a very special role in, in helping us understand some of the tactics that we'll look at today. Not with us, but a key part of our team is Dean uh, Halter. And Dean is our, is our IT risk management officer and played a huge role in helping us deal with a lot of the logistics around that. As we start into the, the next slide, what we thought we would do is start with a quick poll. Uh, and what, we, what we're sharing here is the Sans Institute Security Awareness Maturity Model. Fancy words for where does your organization stand in terms of its readiness for, uh, for uh, cyber uh, awareness training and education. And so we're gonna bring up a poll and we're gonna ask you to kind of place on that, on the poll, you know, respond, where do you see your organization landing? This will really help us as we go through our conversation today to explain that. So we're gonna run that poll, go ahead and pick a, pick a point. Uh, just, a, just kind of a quick, quick kind of explanation there. Obviously non, non-existent means that you're not doing much at all with, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with a program at all. Compliance focuses are, are for those organizations that are looking at the kinds of audit requirements. Perhaps you do once a year training and you, you track that in kind of a, a, an ad hoc fashion. Um, the third area would be if you're doing a, a much more intense promoting awareness and behavior change, and that model, of course, uh, it, uh, begins to deal with that engagement around, uh, you know, uh, interesting communication practices, ongoing activities, those kinds of things. And of course, if you're in the next area where you're doing long-term sustainment and culture change, that would be where you really begin to look at the, um, a role where you have strong leadership support. You're doing an ongoing engagement in very regular ways. And then finally, 
uh, the metrics framework. And if anybody is in this, this category, you can join us up here and help us give this presentation because the metrics framework is one where you're not only using robust metrics as part of the capturing of what's happening, but you're applying those in a continuous improvement model. And uh, there, there are not many organizations that have achieved that level of sophistication, but you might be among one of them. So uh, select one of those and we will be able to get a sense and we'll share that poll back to you in just a, just a moment. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting things for us is that as we look at the, the, the kind of SANS Institute maturity model, uh, we, we believe that we kind of land in that long-term sustainment category. But we also know that we have some gaps there. Like for example, we haven't quite refined our onboarding for our new users yet in a way that is systematic and sustainable. So we, we are still dealing with some of our gaps. So I don't know if we have, if we have those results up, but, uh, and, and there we are. So th th and this is interesting. So we have about 30% of our audience out there in the, in the non-existent category, 15% compliance focused, 25% uh, are in that promoting awareness and behavior change, and 35% are fitting into that long-term sustainment. So this is a, a great mix of, of folks out there, and we're gonna look forward to then sharing some of the, some of the uh, uh, practices that we do. So thanks, Toby, for that. We can, we can take that poll down, and we'll move on to our next slide. Uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna give you a little bit of an insight into where we started on this, and then how the research that we've looked at in the social science arena has helped guide some of the work that we've done, and ultimately how that drove us in the development of our cyber mindfulness model. And then we're gonna talk a bit about how, how various tactics, such as fish training, is being used to help us develop the awareness and sustainable practices out there. We're gonna, and of course, the one thing that many organizations are very concerned about is how do you measure the results of what you're doing? And finally, we're gonna share a bit about the lessons that we've learned. So as we start through this, um, we'll begin just at the very beginning. In, in about 2015, uh, the University of Dayton began looking at the possibility of moving towards a much more intense uh, cybersecurity model. And that model was going to include the implementation of two-factor authentication on most of our systems. And as we began thinking about that, the one concern that emerged for us is that, that our, our user community may very quickly assume that with the implementation of two-factor authentication, we will begin to have folks think that that's great, all security is taken care of, I don't have to worry about this anymore, and they can move on. And as we began talking that through, we realized that before we go to two-factor authentication, we really needed to do something that would, uh, that would engage our, our community in much more thoughtful cybersecurity behaviors. And so we decided to build out a year, what we called our year of, of computer awareness or a year of safe computing. And, and that project led us into the development of the model that we're gonna to share today. One of the things that, that we realized as we went into this is that we had a great deal of, of folks on our staff who were very traditional in the way they came at uh, cybersecurity awareness and training. Uh, for the most part, you know, those folks were, you know, kind of used to doing scattershot kind of approaches to cyber training and awareness. We tended to do what many IT organizations do, and that's to kind of, you know, issue requirements or mandates and rules and not to really think much about how that engagement might work. And so our, our beginning stages there began to say, okay, what can we think about doing to change that piece of it? On the other side, with our, with our faculty, staff, and students, what we realized that most of them was, were relatively you know, uninformed or misinformed about the real threats that were out there. We were, we were at a point where we didn't pay a lot of attention to telling people about what's happening or what they might do about it. And so we began thinking that how do we transition from a, you know, an organization of employees that may not be very aware of cybersecurity and know little or nothing about what they can do about it into an organization that was much more responsive and, and active in that area. So with that in mind, we, we kind of moved towards this, this idea of realizing that, that there's a group of folks within our organization that fit into this category of cyber carelessness or cyber careless. And that's the folks who kind of thought, you know, um, I, you know, IT is in charge of security, I don't have to worry about this, or I'm much too small an organization or nobody really cares about my stuff, so there's no real need for me to worry about these kinds of problems. And that was a group that we thought we really needed to begin addressing in some meaningful ways. But on the other side of this is this other group of folks that we discovered, which are what we call our cyber cynics or our cyber fatigue group. And these are the folks that are paying a lot of attention to the, to the media stories that are kind of told as horror stories 
about what's wrong with cybersecurity and how you really can't stop the bad guys. And so this group of folks feel that there's nothing they can really do to secure uh, their, their data or their t technology. And that certainly that um, if anybody wants my stuff, there's nothing I can do to stop that. And we felt that it was very important that we really balance those two perspective in moving towards a model that would help us, you know, help us really address the, the risks that are there. So what we wanted to do is make sure that as we began our awareness training, that we were sensitive to this balance, that we didn't, we didn't ignore those on the, on the carelessness side, and we didn't create um, a group of folks that felt that cybersecurity was so, so dangerously powerful uh, in terms of what the bad guys could do, that there's little that they could do to impact that. And so, uh, so what, we, what we began doing is we began looking at social science. And, and in that terms, we want to know what evidence-based research um, can, we, can we identify that can tell us what's most effective in the ways that we would impact the behaviors of our users. And so with that, we uh, will have uh, some comments from Danny Robinson, and he's going to talk a bit about, uh, about uh, what we've done in that arena. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about social influence theory and how social influence theory applies to cybersecurity. There are a number of relevant social science theories that I would like to discuss, but I'm going to cover them pretty quickly because of our uh, limited amount of time together. Uh, but if you are interested in more detail on a specific theory or, uh, or all of the theories, if you just let us know, we'll forward you a handout that has more detailed information and it also has a reasonable bibliography at the back so you can do some deep diving into this on, on your own time. <clears throat> Uh, what these theories tell us is that communication is a complex process. For communication to occur, it requires that the individuals are exposed to the message, that they attend to the message, that they comprehend or understand the message, and of course that they retain the message. If any of those events don't occur, there's little chance of a message being effective. Now, if you keep that in mind and you think about designing a message campaign, you, you begin to see why message campaigns are so difficult. They're difficult in large part because so many things have to happen in a particular order for there to be success. This, these theories also tell us that, uh, that a critical element of message effectiveness has to do with the relationship between the communicants. And so when we talk about the relationship between communicants, one of the things that we want to make sure that we don't do is that we think about it in terms of everybody has to be best friends or something like that. Rather, what has to happen is, is that people have to understand the nature of their relationship with the other person so that they can have a better understanding of how that message, whatever message that they send, how that message will be understood by, uh, by their target audience. In fact, the importance of, of this contextualization and relationship is so important that it's pretty safe to say that if you change the nature of the relationship, and that's just a perceptual variable, if, you've, if people perceive their relationship to be in a particular way, it actually changes, uh, it actually changes the meaning of the message. Um, Obviously, here in this, if this, 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 this theory helps us understand some important implications to the, the idea of staff end user relationships. And so we'll talk more about that, and we'll also talk about the development of a sense of agency uh, throughout this presentation. Um, finally, uh, people people oftentimes think that you know that we process information in a very very careful way uh, we like to think we have most social science theories predicated on the assumption that that people are rational and while people are indeed at times rational there are other times when they're not rational and when they're they're not behaving in a particularly rational way what they do is they rely on peripheral cues so they use things like the credibility of the speaker or the attractiveness of a speaker and they use those heuristics to decide whether they agree or they disagree with the message. And so one of our goals in this campaign is, is to help people move from that peripheral kind of processing, oh, I have an email, 
oh, it says do something. I click on the link to get this out of my in basket. Lo and behold, I've made a tragic mistake into uh, processing email messages like that in a, in a, in a careful or more uh, scrutinize those messages more carefully. And so they, they start looking for things like, is there, any, is there anybody making a request of me here to perform some behavior? And if they are, then I need to, as a matter of practice, I need to double down my, my, efforts, at, uh, my efforts at being mindful. The, uh, the, the basis of many, many, many of the theories of campaigns and health information campaigns and frankly any kind of campaign comes from this idea of the health belief model. In the 1950s, the health belief model was developed to explain how public health officials could get people to engage in healthy behaviors. Things like getting, uh, getting people to get an x-ray or get a vaccination. Now, but the government was offering these programs at this time and for free and they couldn't get, they were getting very, very low turnout on, uh, on people actually taking advantage of these opportunities. And so these researchers came up with this model and what they found out was, was that if you want to get people to enact in a healthy behavior, then one of the critical elements, the first critical element is, is that you have to make the people feel susceptible to the health risk. In addition, they also have to believe, and you have to be able to demonstrate in your message strategy, that the, that the consequences are severe or that they're significant enough to merit the person's actual behavior, get them off the snide, so to speak. Third, we need, to, we need in our campaigns, in our message campaigns, we need to make sure that we offer people solutions that they believe will be effective. So it's critical that we can demonstrate the effectiveness of our solutions if we're gonna to try to get people to adopt them. And then last but not least, and this is really important, and something that we typically, one of the weaker areas in information campaigns and training is the development of that sense of efficacy. And of course, by efficacy, what we mean is, is that, you know, that people feel like they can successfully enact the behaviors that you're trying to promote. So if it's a fishing, an anti fishing campaign people need to feel like they can identify fishing messages when they see them and they know appropriate behaviors to avoid those uh, to avoid those problems so you can see then that the basic message strategy is kind of a kind of a rewards cost ratio examination where people need to see that the that the potential problems that are that, that are that are out there are more costly than the solutions that we offer them to avoid those problems, okay? Now, uh, a couple more things that almost sound like they're outside the campaign, but they, they really, really strengthen the campaign, and that is, is that we have, to, we have to develop within our message strategy, within our training, we have to develop reminders and cues that'll activate thoughts about cybersecurity when the people are not engaged in training. We've all been parts of, of, of training campaigns where we do something at the beginning of the year and then we promptly forget about it and uh, avoid thinking about it until the next time we have to go through that training. And so campaigns that are designed to promote uh, behaviors that are, you know, we could call them chronic to stay with our health belief kind of orientation, things that people have to be aware of all the time, it's critical that we offer them opportunities to be reminded of that on a regular basis. Finally, in terms of the health belief model, one of the things that the health belief model has taught us that's really, really important is, is that people are not, contrary to popular, popular belief, people are not particularly concerned about their health until they don't have it. You would think that everybody, everybody will tell you, oh, I'm very, very concerned about my health. You don't have anything if you don't have your health. But the truth of the matter is, is that until people don't have it, they kind of take it for granted. So you have to ask yourself, well, why in the world would we be talking about health campaigns when we're supposed to be talking about cybersecurity? And the answer is, is because we found essentially the same thing holds true with cybersecurity safety behaviors. People don't value cybersecurity very much until they lose it. So our training efforts in our campaign, one of the things that we try to do then is we try to demonstrate susceptibility to attack. So we put this into action in a, in a variety of ways. One of the things that we did was we provide uh, campus fishing exercises through a company called Know Before. And what they, that, that allows the people to do is it allows them to actually have the experience of being fished if they 
in fact, fall for a fish. In addition to this, the, we also have newsletters that re reinforce this notion of susceptibility. In those newsletters, we talk about how often breaches happen, uh, other famous breaches that have happened around the world. And, uh, and in a sense, we, we, we provide people with that, again, that susceptibility information. But in our, in our newsletters, we also provide people with the information about, about the effectiveness of that strategy by putting in things about, here's an example of a person who didn't fall for a for a fishing exploit on our campus. Um, so, uh, you know, it's important that people have that experience and that they have it in under circumstances where they don't feel like that they're gonna be punished or that the consequences are gonna be punitive. We try to, we try to, we try to think of these, these fishing exercises is it like any other kind of exercise. It's important that we understand that this is something that we do to increase and improve our strength or our skills. And so when we fail, we try to use that failure as a way to strengthen us in the future. One of the things that we have found has been really important to, to communicate to people is the fact that everybody falls for phishing campaigns if the message is good enough. If a message resonates, people will click or people will open files or people will provide information. That's just the nature of human behavior. You're never gonna get away with that 100%. But the good news is, is that we can, re we, we can still dramatically reduce it and by providing people with not only, not only the skills and the information that they need, but the practice that they need, then ideally what happens then is, is it becomes a more common topic of conversation on campus people begin to generalize those principles and skills into their everyday lives, and then it makes them less susceptible to new fishing or new, new kinds of exploits that they might be susceptible to at some point in the future that maybe we've never had an opportunity to even train them up on. So, so, so we, we talk about severity, we talk about, uh, we talk about susceptibility, and I guess, um, uh, when we talk about severity, we, we, we try to promote the idea that there are personal consequences to these behaviors, you know, but there's also uh, organizational consequences and there's even work group or more local, you know, local group kinds of consequences to these, to these uh, problems. And so by doing that, by making people feel that they're part of the organization and that they're actually, you know, part, they're, they're actually the first line of defense for our networks, but by trying to do that and promoting that sense of agency, we have found that people feel a lot more responsibility, not just to be careful with their own behavior, but they feel they feel the need and they feel that they want to remind or warn other people if they've fallen for mistakes. So we get stories all the time about people who say, you know, I fell for this, or I got an email that looks like a phishing exploit, and they'll they'll They'll, they'll crank out a they'll crank out an email to ten or twelve of their colleagues saying hey be careful there's this this is kind of going on and so this is the kind of this is the kind of influence that you know that is uh, kind of hard for, for for organizations to target sometime but it's clear evidence that we are we are improving people's awareness of, of cybersecurity on campus um, it's critical, and in our newsletters we do this too, that we demonstrate that our solutions are effective. So we, we talked about that a little bit already. So what we try to do is we try to provide a, a few or a variety of tips, and some of which that are, are, are relatively easy for the, for the end user to, an, to enact or to engage in. And so we do that for obvious reasons so that we can have success, but we also do it because when people have some experience, say for example, in these phishing campaigns and they gain some success, oh, I identified, uh, I identified a phishing exploit, then what happens is, is that it increases their sense of personal efficacy. And so one of the things that we know about, about uh, changing people's behavior is, is that not only do they have to believe that the solutions or the changes that they're con considering are gonna be effective, but they also have to believe that they will be able to perform those behaviors effectively. And that's, again, that's one of those, that's one of those, you know, byproducts of a body of literature that's been done on fear appeals, where we find that when we scare people or try to scare people straight or try to scare people into uh, making sure that they don't make some kind of a mistake, that what happens is, is that if we really, 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 truly scare them, 
what they do, what ends up happening is, is they end up feeling like there's nothing that I can do this. And so they just ignore it and they try not to think about it. But when they feel efficacious, when they feel like they can do something about this, and when they feel like the solution that we're offering them is something that can help them avoid this, then they're more likely to enact the, the, the behaviors that we're trying to promote. Um, perhaps, you know, perhaps more, one of the most important things that we do is, is that we, 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 we provide those cues for, for, our, for our end users to make sure that the computer security and cyber mindfulness is always at the, at the front of their mind as much as possible. And we do this in a variety of ways, and Kim's gonna talk about more about that in a few minutes. But one of the things that we've done is we try to brand and use colors and, lo and logos and, and uh, the, those, kinds of, um, those kinds of heuristics so that people, when they see, you know, we hope that when they see an orange pylon that they think about cybersecurity because we used uh, orange as one of the colors in our, in our uh, cyber mindfulness campaign. But you have to be careful with these, with these strategies because anytime you try to use logos and branding and those kinds of, uh, those kinds of uh, uh, priming tricks, getting that to the front of people's mind, you have to be careful because those cues can lose their effectiveness over time. And so once again, it comes back to that development of a sense of relationship and that development of a sense of agency between the end users and the IT department and the organization. Because the same messages that can be viewed, the exact same message that can be viewed as nagging by, by, by if one person does it, can be viewed as somebody trying to provide me, uh, uh, pro provide me with service or help, or you, they can even view it as contextualized care. And so when you, if you can get your end users to that stage where they think that the people in IT actually care about them and are trying to help them and not just trying to tell them what they're doing is, is wrong, then I think that what you'll see is you'll see a, a, an increase in awareness, you'll see an increase in discussions about cybersecurity at your place of business, and you'll see that people take these skills and they take them home with them and they, they, they find that they improve their, their personal security as well. Okay, so um, the, the last thing that I wanna talk about is a kind of summary is, is this idea that, you know, um, in general, what we know from social science research is, is that is that the knowledge of the risk, a sense of efficacy, and frequent cues in constructing an awareness program can help you be more effective in changing attitudes and behaviors. Particularly when we, those messages come from somebody that we have a positive professional relationship with, and we feel like we're in a partnership to help protect everyone else's data as well as our own. So to further discuss the cyber mindfulness model, I'm gonna turn this back over to Tom Skill. Yeah, thanks, Danny. So we saw here that evidence-based social science research drove us to think differently about the ways that we train and educate for cybersecurity. And, and part of this model begins in an area that is very, very frequently used by pretty much anybody doing something in cybersecurity, and that's the awareness stage of, of cyber uh, uh, education. And at this stage, what we're looking at is the, is, you know, the awareness that our users have a sense of the personal and institutional risks. They're learning about the threats that are there and, and they're continuing to learn about them. The way that we, the way that we categorize this or the way that we would capture um, a success in this stage is that if our users are saying, hey, I know that cybersecurity threats are real, persistent, and dangerous. And so with that, you know, that, that's a pretty standard piece. Here's where, here's where things kind of change a bit for us. So typically in, a, in those awareness programs, we jump right from awareness into the assumed uh, uh, stage where people will move to action. And you know, at the action stage, you're looking at, you know, are they actually able to enact behaviors? Are they, able, are they looking at those threats and are they taking preventive actions to that? And, you know, and, and here at that stage, people would say, hey, I will take actions to reduce risks to my organization and I have practiced them. That's where we all want to land. That's, that's the goal there. But the struggle that, that we, we realized in this particular model, it was missing a very important middle stage. And that's the stage that, that Danny talked a bit about is this agency approach where people are really developing this attitude of personal responsibility and, and accepting that responsibility and seeing it as shared among the community that their members uh, with. And so, you know, success at this stage would, would have our, our users saying, hey, I believe these risks are important and meaningful and I can do something about that. 
So creating a sense of agency in your user community is critical to achieving sustained attention to cybersecurity. And that's what brings us into this, this next stage of saying, okay, so if cyber mindfulness is about awareness, agency, and action, so how does this model fit in here? And this is where we see our, our back to our, what we call our engagement fulcrum, where we're saying that we've got to make sure that we're paying attention to the way we engage with our user community so that we're moving them from cyber carelessness to a midpoint and from cyber fatigue to a midpoint. And of course, that is, um, that is cyber mindfulness. So in, in, in ways of, of, of achieving this kind of outcome, Kim's going to walk us through the tactics, tactics that will help you establish cyber mindfulness in your community. Thanks, Tom. Sure. So having identified cyber mindfulness as that quality we wanted to encourage within our user community, um, we wanted to build an awareness campaign that would put that social science theory into action to motivate that kind of a change. And we approached this project as communicators rather than IT technicians. We wanted to build an inf information security awareness program rather than kind of a traditional information security training program per se. So we started by considering the facets that most communicated communications professionals are going to consider when they're planning a campaign like this. Uh, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the nuts and bolts of our planning, but just to give you an idea of how we approached this, um, we took some time thinking about our audience. So what did they already know about the topic? You know, as Tom mentioned earlier, we suspected this was probably all over the all over the board. And we wanted to know too what their current attitudes were. Were they intimidated? Were they disinterested? Were they confused? So we conducted a survey at the outset and we found out that a, a good portion of our respondents felt that cybersecurity was definitely IT's job and it wasn't something they should have to deal with themselves and they didn't really have a role to play, which told us that we definitely had some um, room to improve with this awareness campaign. And we also thought about the messages we need to reiterate throughout the campaign to make our um, community more likely to think and act more cyber mindfully. So particularly messages that concentrated on agency and efficacy. And then we came back to those messages kind of over and over and over again in the hopes that they'd really start to permeate our campus culture. Um, for message delivery, we're thinking here about both tone and the communication channels we're using. So very intentionally, we took a tone that was very casual and friendly in the language we use so we didn't intimidate our less technical colleagues or worse, bore them because we need their attention. So we tried to infuse some humor and keep things light and interesting throughout. And of course, as we know, um, people consume information in different ways. So we wanted to use a variety of channels to get this information out as well. Um, our monthly e-newsletter was kind of the primary vehicle, but we also used some face-to-face -face outreach and monthly fishing exercises that um, Danny mentioned and that we'll talk about more in a bit. And we used some giveaways. So for instance, we had pens and mugs and clips and all these kind of tangible clue cues um, that would, again, like Danny mentioned, try to remind people um, in a real physical way to, to think about safe computing. And as you can see, we used a nice bright orange. So these would be un unavoidable. They would have to have to see these. Um, and at the outset, at the outset of this also, we worried about what kind of uh, measurements we would do at the end. And Elizabeth will talk about how we kind of measured whether this was working or not. So how did this end up being different from a kind of traditional information security training approach. Um, you know, as I mentioned, those considerations that we just talked about are pretty standard for communication planning, but we found that this did lead us to a different kind of approach than if we'd done a compliance focused or an annual training kind of model. So first, we were really intentional about, intentional about uh, inviting interaction with our campus audience. We wanted to, in our newsletters, for instance, um, offer opportunities for them to interact with us. So we offered to send them swag if they were applied with input or an answer to a question. And a lot of these questions we'd even ask weren't related to cybersecurity per se. So for instance, we asked them in one newsletter to send us something that was the same cyber mindful orange as the swag we sent out. And we got these kind of responses back. That data security poster you can see there at right, one of our community members actually created that. She said she spent the time cutting up all that confetti. She said it took her forever. And the bottom, if you can't read it, it says no personal or identifying information was harmed in the creation of this photograph. So um, you can tell people kind of enjoyed this. That car was some, some guy's wife's car, he said, that he sent in. So again, these didn't teach people about safe computing, but they were an incentive to open and read their emails because they might find something kind of random and fun in there. And that's worked really well for us. Um, we also offered kind of face-to-face -face opportunities. We did a, a secure disposal event for old equipment. We did lunchtime information sessions, those kinds of things. 
And also, as I mentioned earlier, we took a tone that was different from our other IT communications that we'd sent out in the past. So instead of being kind of preachy or technical, we looked for ways to put a little energy and life into our messaging because we knew that even if all the facts were there, if it was boring, no one was going to pay attention to it. And attention is really what we were looking for. So for an example, um, this is just the header to one of our newsletters. Uh, you'll see that this monthly topic, Home Safe Home, is going to focus on digital assistant devices. And we also included some enticements to engage in that cyber mindful summer camp that had a little section where they had a, a chance to respond with something. Um, and then we would update on the campus fish training and that fish commission section that was short for fishing commissioner. So that was our personification of the mysterious IT staffer who ran the monthly training exercises, kind of like the banker and deal or no deal that you see up there in the up in the heavens during that game show. So we also had um, Elizabeth was able to design kind of a custom image for each month's theme and we pepper in some comics or some memes along the way to keep things interesting. So again, the goal was to kind of keep this approachable and interesting. To help build our community's confidence about their own ability to actually take the right actions to protect themselves, we, pro we provided these chances for practice through our monthly fishing exercises. Uh, and with any other skill, like any other skill, we have to learn from a book or a class until we actually put it into practice. We don't really absorb that. So this is a really good hands-on way to do that. And we'd hear back again from many folks about how they caught this one or they clicked on that one. So they seem to kind of enjoy these as a chance to show off their skills. Here you'll see kind of an example of one of the landing pages they'd hit. If they clicked on a message, it would give them a couple of reminders about what they could look for in the future if they'd um, receive another suspicious looking message. And as I showed you earlier, we did have a batch of these low cost swag items that we could use as incentives for interaction, but we've also been really deliberate about responding to reports of potential phishing messages or questions with um, sincere appreciation. So for instance, you know, during our monthly phishing exercises, all of us on the safe computing team, we're bound to get many emails just like this, where they forward us something and say, hey, found this. Um, is this something I should worry about? I just want to let you know this, but hit my inbox. Um, and it would either go to our help desk or to all of us individually. And our appreciative responses to these reports really are sincere. We know that if a live phishing exploit hits our campus, these are the kinds of er early reports from our most alert users that are gonna be the early warning system we need to take action quickly. So we want our community to know that we, that we recognize that they're taking time out of their day to, to pay attention and reach out to us to protect the whole campus. And that's a great service to the organization. And while annual compliance-based information security training certainly has a role to play in a lot of organizations, we decided early on that that's not where, where we wanted to start this conversation with our campus community. As Tom mentioned, we hadn't done any kind of intentional um, training on this topic, so we didn't want to start it with this kind of one and done approach. Um, and we didn't think that that was going to move the needle on attitude and behavior change if we had our users do kind of one training exercise and then didn't say anything about it till the next year. So we committed to a steady stream of information doled out over the course of an entire year. You'll see here, this is just kind of the, um, the way we charted out that first year's worth of information. We borrowed a lot of resources and ideas from um, organizations like Stop, Think, Connect and the SANS Institute and Stay Safe Online. They've got a treasure trove of great stuff you can borrow from. And the whole fourth quarter of our campaign, though, focused around the two-factor authentication um, implementation that we were getting ready for at the time. And of course, at the end of the year, we realized that if we wanted to build on that momentum and um, culture change that we'd started, we were going to have to continue this. So it couldn't be even a one-year-and-done program. It was going to be a, an ongoing thing. And finally, um, one the last way we thought this was different from kind of a traditional approach was that we worked with our campus IT staff really deliberately to make sure that whenever a, uni a user reached out to ask one of these questions or check about a suspicious email, that they'd receive a welcoming, helpful response. And we cannot emphasize this point enough. Um, we know that if someone reaches out and they feel like they're an annoyance or they're asking a dumb question, that's likely going to be the last time they reach out to us. And if we really want to activate our community as first alert allies when that zero day exploit hits, they've got to feel comfortable coming to us. And this can be hard some days, uh, particularly, you know, when you're busy or you know that the monthly fishing exercise just went out and you're bound to get a whole bunch of emails that day or the next few days. But we see this investment of time by our IT staff as an integral part of building those relationships with our community that are going to pay off if a social engineering attack really hits our campus. 
So in a nutshell, it really boils down to this. We try to give our community permission not to be the experts. Um, our message consistently throughout this campaign has been that everyone has a role to play in keeping our campus data and systems safe, but that role doesn't require having lots of technical know-how or knowing all the answers. Um, we just want them to reach out to us if something seems strange and trust that their IT team will help them figure out what to do from there. And we think that that's a lot more manageable for our non-technical users especially, because we're setting a reasonable expectation for how they can help to keep the campus secure. That reinforces that sense of agency. It's something that's really doable to them. They can just say, well, I, I don't know what to do about this, but I know I can you know, raise the alarm about it. Um, and that, we think, makes them much more likely to engage. So, um, you know, important part of running this campaign is making sure that you can measure the, hope, the hoped for change. Um, you want to keep those measurements so that you can justify the effort um, to your leadership and also so that you can learn uh, what works and what doesn't work for your ongoing efforts. So how do you know something is working? How do you know um, what if someone doesn't click a link, if they are behaving cyber mindfully, how do you measure that? So it can be tricky, but there are indicators that are measurable. Um, there are things you can track, things that will demonstrate change, and so I just want to quickly talk about some of those. Um, an obvious one is the phishing statistics. Um, I do want to say a little bit about how we ran our phishing campaign. Um, as Kim already mentioned and Danny mentioned, um, we presented this as an exercise, and I just want to point out that um, this was a no shame, no singling out anyone, um, it, except for the very first test that we did as a benchmark. Um, we always told people that um, we were going to do this monthly and um, we would report back to them um, how that progress was going. Uh, this shows you um, very briefly over time that your results are not going to be a steady decline. Um, ours certainly weren't. Um, what we found was that it really depended on the nature of the fish exercise itself. Um, so I want to show you just some of the kinds of fish we ran. Um, we did fishing with inline links, and if you look at the bolded boxes, you see that um, we did one where it was an Amazon order or a FedEx package delivery, and people were um, asked to click a link to track their order. But over time, so we ran this three times, we did see a decrease um, in the, the click rates responding to that Amazon order. Um, and we also saw declines in other kinds of phishing with inline links. We did tests that included an attachment. Um, you can see an example of, of one of the uh, tests we ran with a Blue Cross donation, where we told people they had, uh, thank you for their donation, please click the receipt. This would require them to open the attachment and even enable macros. And we did have people go that far and do it, but over time, again, by running those kinds of tests again, um, we got to see a decrease. We also ran uh, fish that would ask for login credentials. So open a doc and it would require your uh, Google uh, credentials to view that doc. So with comparative phishing exercise over time, we can gather statistics that show our messaging was having the desired impact. But um, other ways you can uh, measure your success, um, we really relied on anecdotal evidence. This is a legitimate way of measuring effectiveness. And so we would hear stories. Um, Tom would be out in meetings across campus and um, administrators, staff, leadership would tell him stories uh, about um, you know, a fish they got and they were so proud because they hadn't uh, clicked the link. Um, even a single anecdote of success can be really powerful to share with your community or with your leadership um, as a demonstration of, of your awareness campaign taking hold. Proactive reporting is also another thing you can track. So, um, you know, when you get reports to your help desk or you're hearing um, reports of people saying, you know, I saw a fish and I started alerting other people in my office about it. You can track that sort of reporting as another measurable indicator that the awareness campaign is effective. Also from the beginning, we decided to track that one-on-one -on -one, um, engagement that we were really um, 
focusing on. So discrete uh, interactions with people. If we sent them email, if we sent them swag, if they attended an event, we kept track of every single one of those people so that we knew over time how many people we were directly impacting. Also, you can take a look at your help desk tickets or lack thereof as an indicator, um, maybe of a reduction in malware compromises or other reports of um, issues. And then finally, and importantly, surveying. So at the beginning, we did a survey uh, and a lot of it was focused on trying to get a sense of where our audience was with their attitudes and their sense of agency. Um, and I do just want to show you some of the things we asked in that survey as maybe a, a, a way to help you think about how do you survey for attitude. Um, and so we asked people um, to agree or disagree with some, some claims. Uh, for example, everyone has a responsibility to protect their computer from hackers and to ensure that stored info is secure. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Um, another type of attitude question, if hackers want to break into a computer system, there's little I can do to stop them. And we certainly had um, strong agreement coming from a part of our audience on that. Uh, computer security is really a technology issue that should be handled by IT. Again, um, that was a question that um, we saw a lot more agreement with than we wanted to, and we knew that that, was, that meant we needed to address that. Uh, and finally, I am confident that I would recognize a suspicious email message. Again, what is their knowledge? What is their confidence? What is their attitude? And so over time, um, you know, we're hoping to move the needle on those attitudes um, and sense of agency. And so we did a follow-up survey after a year um, so that we could measure the change in attitude um, and agency. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Tom, and he's going to talk about our lessons learned. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. So you're getting a sense for some of the tactical practices and the, and the, and the, the, the deep evidence-based uh, research that we've been driving a lot of our work around. One of the things that, that we wanted to spend a little bit of time on is talk a little about some of the lessons that we learned, and, and there's several. I mean, one of the advantages I'll start off with that's not on the list is that as a, as a university campus community, uh, we, we have the, the great challenge of having a much more open and risk-prone environment where people are doing lots of things. And that gave us some struggles. But on the other hand, we also have the opportunity to, to connect with our academic colleagues, like we did with, with uh, Danny Robinson from, from the Department of Communication, where we were able to apply a lot of that research. So, so the partnering in there is something that in, in organizations like higher ed, um, I think that that is one lesson that we learned that made this project a much more engaging and fun project for the team of folks that we did over a long bit of time. So, so that's, the, that's a good side of the lesson there. Some of the challenges I think that you'll see out there though is that one thing you have to understand is that there's a very, very significant time and talent commitment that you have to make to this. This is not something that you can simply do as a one and done kind of effort. In fact, the Sans Institute reports that they see a minimum of, of an FPE, that full-time equivalent, of being more than just one person's effort on an ongoing basis. Um, the, the other piece that we believe is the core to the success of what we were doing is the, is the commitment level that we were able to get from our campus leadership. Uh, and I think the important piece here is that with this campaign, no one was exempt from being engaged in it. That means that the fishes went to everybody, including presidents and provosts and, and IT staff. And so that, and, that, and that leadership within the campus community supported us doing those kinds of things and in reaching out to the community and making this a serious um, endeavor for our part. But I think the, the, the primary piece that I think we wanna have you walk away with in terms of some of the lessons learned there is the importance of the relationship. I think that what we did is that we understood that this is not a campaign that comes from some anonymous unknown place. It's not the IT department that's doing this. It is, it is our organization, it is our people by name building these closer, more, more significant relationships with our campus community. And, that, and one of the consequences of that is that you have a much higher rate of, of what we would call false positives, uh, but in many cases, I call that an engagement opportunity, is that you have folks contacting you on a regular basis, wanting to know, is this real? Should I be worried about this? And what we, what we discovered there is that we needed to spend a, a lot of time working with our, 
with our, our, our staff to uh, make sure that they understand the importance of, of preserving and building that relationship. We don't want to walk away from any of those, uh, of those opportunities to, to link there. So relationships really are really one of the most important pieces that we want to do there. Um, I think that as we look a little bit further down the road, and we're going to, we're going to jump into a, 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 another poll in a second, but as we look down the road, we know that we, we have to work on building soft skills in our IT staffs around this. This is something that, that many organizations would want to think about doing. I think the other part, too, is that we have to realize that as an organization ourselves, thinking about cybersecurity, that we have to develop a much a, a maturing attitude towards that, much like we saw in that, in that SANS uh, uh, a maturity scale that we've shared earlier on. So what we have is I'm going to I'm going to jump because we have a another quick poll that, that we wanted to share with our group out there and, and this is where we wanted to kind of test the waters in terms of wh what are you hearing from us in terms of the biggest challenges that you feel you face in building out your security um, awareness program. You know, is it is it in the management support area? Is it in the resources area? Is it in the the staff skill sets? Perhaps organizational culture is part of it, that you have folks that are resistant to training and, and education in these areas, or is it the fact that you may be looking at some real challenges there around employee engagement? And I think that on this, on this poll, you can click more than one item if you, so if you, if you feel that you have several of those that are, that are hitting you at this point. Um, and we're going to just give you a second there to do that. And while we're doing that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look to... Um, to Ira to, to, to share with us if he has any questions he might want to get back to us to deal with, and then we can share the results of this poll in just a, just a couple seconds here. Uh, sure, Tom, thanks. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, it's very interesting. I do have a couple of questions, and uh, I also want to remind people that uh, please, uh, if you have questions, enter in the Q&A uh, section, you'll find at the bottom of your screen. So one thing I'm curious about, uh, obviously this is an investment in money and time, why did you decide or how did the university come to the decision that uh, you wanted to invest in educating your user community as opposed to buying, um, you know, more armaments to protect against uh, cyber intrusion, building up bigger firewalls, uh, virus protection? Yeah, great question. And so I, I'd say that it, it's, it's both and. I mean, we, we, we do uh, spend quite a bit of money on, on technology and, and, and to, to you know, secure both the perimeter and the interior. But what we've realized over, over a long period of time is that no amount of technology is going to effectively reduce our risk if we have users that aren't being thoughtful in what they're doing. And the university was really thoughtful about this. And we, I mean, we were lucky because we have a few board members that have a great deal of knowledge in this area. And, and the support we got in pushing this effort forward came not just from our, our senior leadership on campus, but even from our board. And they began kind of discussing uh, with us ways that we can enhance this. And so building out the the, the smart community strategies around cyber mindfulness was something that was that that was mapped as a as a uh, a, a dual track of let's make sure we're giving sufficient technology strength to our to our infrastructure but at the same time there are so many things that the technology appliances can't protect you against that we really had to spend time thinking about how can we help our staff become smart and, and engaged in this process. And I don't know if, I, if my other folks have any other comments to add on there, but do we want to share that poll? All right, great. So, you know, here we're seeing that, and this is not a surprise, is that, you know, it, it, we're, we're all over the map on this, but, you know, the resources is always a huge issue, and, of course, culture is the other one. And, uh, and you know, and I, I, so many times we think about the fact that, you know, culture is king, and therefore, if you don't if you don't have the culture with you, you're not going to be successful. And of course, in many cases, one of the one of the things that I uh, that I shared with our leadership when we talk about the investments that we've had to make in cyber awareness is that I said to them, if we ever had a breach, you would wish you could throw that amount of money at it to solve a breach problem. And so the 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 context there is that the amount of money you're investing up front in awareness is substantially less than you would spend if you had to actually address a true data breach of some type. And the, and the consequence of a data breach, of course, is that you will lose things in terms of reputation in a data breach that you will never recapture with, with no matter how much money you spend on that. So I think that a lot of our organizations begin to understand that allocating those resources in those areas 
are important. And, that, and so I'd encourage folks out there to perhaps try to characterize the fact that, you know, while this doesn't guarantee that we're gonna, that we're gonna um, prevent all breaches, it certainly gives us, and as my, my colleagues in the legal com community say, it, it, it gives us an opportunity to tell the right story in the fact that something does go wrong, the fact that we put that effort in. Now, I'm told that we have a couple questions that came in, yes, so I'm gonna kick it to too. Kim. We have one question about how we might in the future extend some of this um, cyber mindful awareness campaign to our student population. And that is something that we, we did dip our toe into the pool on this fall. Um, in October, when it was National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we, with the help of a very talented GA we're lucky to have, put out a campaign to our student community to try to kind of open this topic that was a real focused four-week campaign. And we're looking at ways that how we can, how we can reach out to them. They're much trickier to reach. <laughs> they're, they're, they're all over the place, uh, technically and, and social media-wise and everything. So that's definitely something we're looking at as a next approach. And particularly because we know they're going to be going into workplaces where they're going to be expected to have these kinds of competencies to help out with their, um, their employer's security risks as well. So we want to make sure we prepare our student body to be successful in that as they go forward. And Tom, I'm going to um, read this question to you and have you um, <laughs> okay. it. It's a great question. Were users introduced to a risk-based approach to cybersecurity? For example, using more resources to protect high-risk assets assets as compared to other low-risk assets? Right. Uh, so that, that's a good question. So part of it was is we began the campaign as a broad-based, everybody is all in. But as the campaign progressed, we began to realize that we needed to, to focus some resources around those who had the, the greatest privileges, the elevated privilege teams. And we've begun, now we haven't fully enacted this yet, but it is part of the, what's on our planning board. And some of this has actually been done on a, on a pilot scale, is where we now are looking at specific user communities at the university that we have judged because of what they can do or what access they have, we have judged them to be a much higher risk. And so what we're doing is that we're gonna be actually targeting those groups with a much more focused level of training and awareness and hopefully uh, we'll be able to learn that um, that they've actually figured this out um, better than some of our average users and that that would be where you'd hope that those with elevated privileges are much more sensitive to that but that's great because actually targeting those groups is something that's absolutely critical to do so wonderful so any other questions Ira yes I have one actually uh, I'm curious and I, and I think I want you to, to sort of elaborate on this point because I'm not sure that it is widely grasped and understood but one of the roles of universities obviously is to educate um, young people to be uh, successful and uh, wonderful members of society and contribute positively uh, what role do higher education institutions have in terms of making students uh, let's say cyber aware uh, of security and uh, taking that knowledge to their organizations as they, you know, join the workforce. Wow, Ex outstanding question. In fact, as Danny's looking at me, this has been an area where we've been spending a good bit of time on that. And, and we began part of this by looking at the generational differences. How are millennials and Gen Z's responding to this? And we, we know that the perception out there is that they may not be as thoughtful or as, as privacy focused. But the thing that we really believe is, is key is as students move through university, developing their cyber savviness skills is absolutely a, a, uh, an enhancement to their resume that we have discovered with the students that we've had go through some of our, our classes on social engineering and cybersecurity communications that in those areas they have found that to be a really a valuable asset in many of the organizations that have interviewed them were, it was clear that that was a, a distinguishing value add to their repertoire of experiences. And so we've been pushing this uh, very thoroughly across campus and, and uh, have had, had very good response from our colleagues. And Ira, we've got one more question I think we'll be able to take. Uh, did you have any legal problem regarding the implementation of the program? Uh, you know, actually, um, you know, we did not. And, you know, in terms of the, our, our assumption there was that all the university personnel are part of our community and engaging them in this awareness campaign was part of the responsibilities of employees. So we didn't have any issues there. And, you know, in terms of, we weren't really ever sharing any privacy data. So on the legal side around private data, 
and, and particularly because we do not even try to call people out if they're, if they're frequently uh, falling for our fishes. It's really more of a proactive approach where we're trying to educate them and be positive about it. So we did not have any legal issues with that, but we are a private university, so we don't have as many constraints perhaps as some of our public colleagues. But I know that we're almost out of time, so I'm gonna kick it back to Ira. Okay, well, you know what, Tom? I'm gonna uh, take the prerogative and throw one more question to you. Okay. Because uh, <laughs> I'm curious, you know, we, we've all had the experience where, you know, you call up the IT, the help desk, uh, and the first response is turn off your computer and, and turn it back on. Uh, uh, so you know, I'm curious, how do you instill that kind of softer skill into the IT department so they really connect with the users? Yeah. You know, that, that, we have really spent a lot of time talking to our IT staff about the importance of these campaigns and, and any kind of an engagement as being our opportunity to build a positive relationship. And, and that to us has been the key to us having folks feel comfortable in engaging with us around real risks that are out there. So we think that the staff has begun, been very responsive to that. I'm sure there are days when they're grumpy and things don't go as well, but I, I'd say that for the most part, our, our staff has been very, very responsive to that. But part of it is that we, you know, we've done this as a, a leadership level initiative. We said, this is really important to, to the university. This is really important to the, to the key directors within IT, and it's important to many of our faculty. So we find that, that the staff has been very responsive to that, and the community uh, feels much more comfortable and bringing any kind of a challenge to, uh, to, to us. We, we don't want to appear to be the cops on the block. We want to be their colleagues and their, and, their, and their partners in solving these very big problems. And that's why we really define the, the whole idea around the fishing as, as an exercise for us to build up our muscles against the bad guys. Uh, and, and that's how we've really turned our user community into our early alert allies. Great. Uh, thank you, Tom, and, and everyone at University of Dayton for a, a wonderful presentation. And for those of you that we didn't get to your questions, we will respond by email. And for those of you that requested more information, we will get that to you shortly. And you can see on the screen here, there's contact information for University of Dayton. And as I said earlier, we will have uh, a recording of this posted on the CGE YouTube channel at the end of day tomorrow. And again, thank you for taking the time to join us. Great. Thank you, everyone. Look forward to hearing from folks. Bye-bye.